All right, if you've got your Bible, let's stretch your legs. I'll read just four verses of Scripture, and then I'll share with you just a, a thought God's put on me this evening. Judges chapter number 16, verse number 19, the Bible said, And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man. She caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. You can be seated. I'll get to my point in just a few minutes and I'll tell you what I'm preaching on when I get back to verse number 22. I'm interested in one word that you find in verse number 22, but let me uh, sort of paint a little backdrop about where we find ourselves in the book of Judges. May we find ourselves in a dark hour in the life of the last judge that's written about in the book of Judges. And uh, Samson finds himself in the prison house. Uh, and man, Samson is a wonderful character as you begin to read and study in the word of God. A uh, Samson is the last judge that's written of in the, in the book of Judges. It begins to tell the story. We find more out about the Samson in his life than we do any other judge in the book of Judges. Uh, but I'm afraid to tell you, neighbor, it's not... Uh, it's not a great picture of Samson. I'm sad to say we learn more what not to do out of the life of Samson than we do what we ought to do and how we ought to live. I mean, man, it begins to talk about the tragic failures and the mistakes that Samson made in his life, unlike his predecessors and the great deliverances that the Lord used them to fault and the great successes that they used or that God used them to deliver the nation of Israel. But I'm glad in spite of Samson's wayward ways, I'm glad there was times in Samson's life where he exercised great faith and where God used him to work wonderful works and bring wonderful victory to the nation of Israel. Then, can I tell you, had Samson lived a consistent life and exercised that faith that God gave him on a daily basis, but Samson would be the greatest judge uh, that Israel would have ever known. Uh, he would have been the best one that they would have ever seen uh, uh, put on shoe leather in Israel. Uh, uh, but I'm ashamed to say that wasn't the story. Uh, uh, but can I say before we give Samson uh, uh, too hard a time, I tell you, uh, I mean, we always, we talk about Samson's failures, uh, how he messed up, how uh, uh, he grieved God. But man, I got to study the other day uh, and I had to stop and shout a little bit uh, in the basement when I began to see some things about the life of Samson. I've read how Samson failed God. I've read how Samson laid down with a harlot. But I never saw that Samson, you could see some pictures of Christ in the life of Samson. Somebody that writer said to the Lord, Oh, we could see the Lord's love in him. He said, can I remind you that Samson loved a worthless Philistine. He loved a worthless Philistine. Oh, that Philistine that was outside of the camp, oh, that was outside of the fellowship with God. Oh, can I remind you of another man oh, that cast his love on a bride who was outside the camp who needed to be reconciled to God. I'm glad 23 years ago, Oh, blessed be God oh, that a man named Jesus oh, loved a little boy who was a Philistine in the eyes of God, who was wicked, and he did not know, oh, listen, did not know the love of Christ. Oh, but I'm glad God looked beyond my fault and saw my need. I'm glad the Lord loved me in my sin. Hallelujah. Uh, he began to write on. And he said, on his way to get his bride, he encountered a lion. Brother Owen, I'm reminded of another man 
that wasn't going to get his bride, but was one that was purchasing a bride. And uh, Samson was not the only one who bumped into a lion. Uh, but I'm glad at the top of a mountain, uh, at the top of a hill, uh, oh, that's called the skull, uh, I'm glad there was another man uh, who bumped into a roaring lion uh, oh, that was seeking to devour the Lord. Uh, oh, but God reached, the Lord reached up uh, and got the hand of God. Uh, and he reached down and got the hand of man uh, and brought them together. Uh, I'm telling you what just like Samson uh, uh, slew that lion with his bare hands uh, I'm glad there was a man named Jesus uh, and when he bumped into the devil uh, and when he bumped into the lion uh, I'm glad he didn't wring his hands uh, I'm glad he didn't have to call 10,000 angels uh, uh, but with the voice he cried it is finished and he gave up the ghost uh, and maybe he slew of the lion once and for all I'm looking for the day when we get to Revelation 2010 when he puts him in the pit. Amen, neighbor. Hey, I'll tell you what else. That writer began to ride on. He said, I remember Samson walking over there and getting honey out of a dead carcass. He said, Samson brought some sweet things out of death. I know another man that brought some sweet things out of death. Hallelujah. I believe Ephesians 2 1 said, and ye being dead in trespasses and sin, oh, that he quickened us, which means he made us alive. I'm telling you, blessed be the Lord Jesus, I was dead in my sin, oh, but God the Holy Ghost oh, reached into the jaws of death and reached into the jaws of what was awful and decay and dying and graveyard dead, and he reached his hand into that old carcass and he put something sweet in there in the person of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, I know a man that's brought some sweet things out of death, amen. Brought some sweet things out of death. Can I say to you, as we make our way back to Judges 16, can I say, Samson had a good, he had a great start. Samson had a great start. You say, what do you mean, preacher? If we could bow back over to Judges 13, let's just walk our way back to Judges 22 and see how Samson got to that place. The Bible said, children of Israel did evil again inside the Lord. Man, and they, had, they were in the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Can I tell you, it was a dark time in the nation of Israel. Man, they had turned their back on God. Uh, they were living in their sin. Uh, but I'm telling you, right in the midst of their blindness uh, and right in the midst of Manoah's wife's barrenness, uh, uh, there was an angel of the Lord. Uh, honey, I believe when you look in that Old Testament uh, and you see the phrase, the angel uh, of the Lord, I don't believe that was Gabriel. Uh, I don't believe that was Michael. Uh, I don't believe that was nobody else outside of the Son of God. I believe that was a Christophany, a pre-Bethlehem appearance. I tell you, I don't want to make you nervous, honey, but Bethlehem wasn't the first time that the Son of God showed up on this earth. I'm glad, listen, Jacob bumped into him. I'm glad, listen, Joshua bumped into him. But I'm telling you, listen, Manoah's wife was barren, and she bare not a son. But listen, they came, but God came and made a revelation uh, right in the midst of Israel's sin uh, and right in the midst of Manoah's wife's barrenness. And I tell you, if you're gonna have the right kind of start, it's gonna have to come by a sovereign revelation. Brother Riddle, I believe you taught us, a man don't get saved outside he gets under conviction. And you say, how to teach that? That's what the Bible said. Yes, let me just say this. It was a year ago. I was preaching in, let me back up. It was about 18 months ago. We were in Longhorns. I was eating supper with Dr. Wendell Runyon. And, uh, and uh, Carter was sitting at the end of the table. Riley was sitting by Dr. Runyon telling him how he got saved. And man, all of a sudden, Carter began to weep and cry like I'd whooped him. And he come over there and Looked in my eyes, tears running down his face, Brother Carl. 
And he said, Daddy, he said, I'm the only one in our family that's not saved. He said, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. Oh, and I crawled out of my chair and that long horns got on the floor. God told me to ask him, I said, son, who told you you was going to hell? He said, you did, Daddy. Why, you was a preacher. And if I've ever felt helpless as a daddy, right then I felt helpless. There wasn't nothing I could do for my boy. And I got on my knees in that long horns with tears running off my face and tears running off his face. I said, son, daddy telling you you're going to hell's not good enough. I said, but one day, God, the Holy Ghost, is going to speak to you and he's going to tell you that you're lost and he's going to tell you you need a savior. And I said, son, the very first time that God speaks to you, you can get saved by the grace of of God and we prayed I was preaching in Ringo brother Carl you were there that night and I walked out and got in my truck there was about 13 voicemails I thought dear Lord the church is burned I thought man I've been voted out I knew something was wrong had to be and I answered all them calls and I got on my voicemail it was my little bit said uh, it was Amy said honey you need to call home and talk to Carter well, that night was the last night of a one, the last night of a children's program. Brother Mark Wheeler had been preaching on 2 Corinthians 6 2. And he preached on now is accepted time. And today is the day of salvation. And Brother Mark said, If God's speaking to you tonight, I want you to raise your hand. A Carter climbed up in the pew, stood up on his feet, put both hands in the air. He said, Daddy, I wanted Brother Mark to know that God was a talking to me. I wanted him to know that he was a talking to my heart and brother Mark said why don't you come son and Carter came running brother David got to deal with it he said Carter why would you come he said I come to get saved he said well is a God speaking to you he said he sure is brother David said what's he saying Carter he said brother David God told me oh, that tonight was my night I'm glad blessed be God for what daddy couldn't do and what mama couldn't do but there was a sovereign a revelation or that he was a sinner and he got saved amen, amen. hallelujah amen. glory to God I'm talking about a sovereign revelation you ever had one I'm not talking about you got to jump through a whole bunch of hoops, neighbor. I'm talking about when God brings you into a consciousness of your sin. Amen. Hallelujah. There was a sovereign revelation. That angel said, I'm going to give you a boy. You remember when you got, you remember when you got lost down there in Plant City, Florida? Amen. You remember that youth camp? Wasn't it youth camp you got saved? South Georgia or North Florida, somewhere down there? Amen. Hey. What your mama couldn't tell you. And what the preacher couldn't tell you. But God showed up in the fire of conviction and showed you your need of a savior. See, there was, he had a good start. He had a sovereign revelation. Let me tell you something, friend. I don't care what you do for God if you don't get to listen. In a lot of places, it's how you finish. But in this thing, it's how you start. Amen. Preacher, I'm convinced we got a whole lot less backslid folks like you said and a whole lot more lost people. Amen, friend. You say, but I felt this. Somebody take a King James and show me anything about feeling and salvation in the same verse. It ain't in there. I believe you said, faith in a feeling never produces a fact. But faith in the right facts will always produce a feeling. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hey, if all you needed was goosebumps, the devil might have gave you that. Oh, but I'm telling you, listen, when God convicted you, oh, listen, they were singing a song the morning. Miss Brenda was singing a song the morning. I got saved that Miss Brother Carl's mama oh, used to sing, Lord, you tore down my castles and my house, my house, my castles of sand. And man, I'm telling you, God stepped across my daddy's lap and stopped before he got to my mama. And 23 years ago, I got saved, amen. Sovereign revelation, but they said there's some special requirements. He said he can't eat no, can't touch the dead thing. He can't eat no wine. He can't be around the vineyard. 
He was a Nazarite. Can I tell you something, child of God? He's going to put some special requirements on you. He had the right kind of start. Can I say quickly? He had in verse 13, last verse, he had spiritual resources. He said, in the spirit of the Lord began to move on him. I'm thankful for the threefold relationship of the Holy Ghost to the believer. I'm so glad I'm not an Old Testament saint. Amen. They wouldn't put one Old Testament saint that the Holy Ghost ever came on and never left. Anybody want to care to venture who that was? It's a preacher's favorite Bible character, David. The Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. You'll never find in that Bible where it left. I believe that's why that New Testament talks about the sure mercies of David. It was sure because God got on him and never left. Hallelujah. Hey, Brother Willard, I'm glad when I got saved, he abides in me. I'm glad when I got saved, he walks with me. But Miss Brenda, I'm glad there's another one. I'm glad he'd still get on me, amen. I want to be like that little colt that come riding in at Matthew 21. That little colt might not have been anything. They made fun of him and said he wasn't a stallion. But there was one thing about it. That little colt had God all over him, amen. And I'm telling you, in this day, we can still get to a place where we can be like that little donkey and God can be all over for us. Hallelujah. He said he had a great start. Can I tell you this? He had a good show. Can I tell you what? Nation of Israel been in the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. They didn't need a praise band to get them out. They didn't need no long-haired hippie preacher. Listen to me, picking no Martin guitar and dancing across the stage to get them out of the Philistines. They needed a man of God who could take the gates off the city and walk down the road with them on his shoulder. They needed a man of God that could take a jawbone of a donkey and slay a thousand men. It ain't changed from when he was a young man and when his preacher was a young man. Listen to me, what this country needs is some men of God that'll take a King James Bible and without apology and without backing up and preach, amen. Let me tell you something, God's plan's always been preaching and it always will be preaching. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm telling you, they ain't nowhere like going home and preaching. You're scared to stinking death. I've been sick all afternoon. I'm starting to feel better. Amen. Somebody said, got all them butterflies in your stomach. They flying in formation right now. Say amen right there. Amen. Hallelujah. It wouldn't hurt some of you to smile. Say amen. It won't, it won't break your face, and it does. Richard done told you he'll pick it back up and make it again. <laughs> I said he had a good show. And there's some folk in here, you had a good start. You really got saved. Man, you was like Samson. Can I tell you how good God is? When Samson, the Lord got on Samson in that vineyard and he killed that lion, can I tell you this? Samson was in the wrong place, going to another wrong place to be with a wrong woman. But God in his mercy, even though he didn't allow, didn't tell Samson not to be there, and though he never had given Samson his permission to go where he was going, he was still God's young man. And God, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord moved on him. And he took his hands and he slew that, uh, he slew that lion. And then he went down there uh, and he made a bet with them Philistines. Uh, and he killed 30 of them, took their clothes off, uh, and paid a gambling debt. Uh, and then he called him 300 foxes uh, and bound them tail to tail uh, and set the Philistines field on fire. Uh, and then he took a jawbone of an ass uh, and killed a thousand men. Uh, and then he went on over there uh, and listened to me, he put his hands on the pillars of that great city and he pushed it down and he killed more in his death than he ever did in his life. Can I tell you something? A Samson had a good show. And some of you got saved, had a great start, and you had a good show. But can I say next quickly? Samson had grievous sin. 
Samson didn't fall overnight, Brother Randy. He tampered and toyed with sin over and over and over again. Can I tell you this? Samson had a honey problem. And it just wasn't the honey that was in that lion's carcass either. It was a Philistine honey problem. Can I say this? You say, well, I'm just living to myself. Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. I'm, I'm just doing my own thing. Let me remind you when Samson put his hand in there and got that honey, he wasn't the only one that ate it. Miss Brenda, he took it over to his mom and daddy. And they weren't supposed to be around dead things. And he said, here, take of this. And he defiled his parents in his own sin. You think you live to yourself. You don't live to yourself. You youngins that are in this youth group, let me tell you something. You don't live to yourself. Your sin affects the whole group. Amen, friend. Hey, and he grieved God. He toyed and tempered and toyed and tempered. Let me tell you something. They ain't nobody beat it before you, and you're not going to beat it. One of my men that I looked up to with great respect this year made some difficult choices in his ministry. And I, he called me on the telephone and we were weeping and crying. And I told him, I said, I don't look at you with a fair sickle nose. I said, I'm absolutely trembling, scared to death because if he can get you, he can get me. And Samson toyed with the devil one time till God just said, all right, have at it. And Brother Randy, he got so dull that he didn't even know that God had left. And I wonder how many of us in here tonight, listen, I'm, we're gonna get, it's going to get better. There's, a, there's one word that changes the whole picture. But I'm telling you what got him to the prison house. I'm telling you what got him to where they blinded him and when they bound him and they were making sport of him. Oh, Dr. Howes had that message, a sin will bind you and sin will blind you and sin will grind. Listen, sin didn't kill him. Them Philistines didn't kill him, but they tortured him. And I'm telling you that some of you know you've been saved. Well, you know you've had a good start. You know you've had a good show. Oh, but something's crept up in your life. It's not killed you, oh, but it's tortured tortured you and tortured you and tortured you. You lay down with it. You get up with it. You work with it. You play with it. It's everywhere you go and it's torturing you on a daily basis. What is it that's caused you to lose it? See, we want to blame it on our surroundings. We want to blame it on other people. Samson's circumstances were a result of Samson's disobedience. Huh? I want you to look at verse 22. I'm about done. There's one word. In verse number 22, it's where it gets sweet. See, it had to get dark before it could get sweet. We had to understand where it came from. Can I tell you, you may have had a good start. You may not have had a start at all. And you could be like these three young ladies this week. Uh, other than trusting God, and you could get the right start. Amen. Uh, hey, I'm like 114 of that red book. Uh, I never have been sorry. Uh, I never have regretted the day uh, on Sunday morning about 1215 uh, 1987 uh, or when I walked this aisle uh, and got born again. I ain't never been sorry. Man, you've even had a good show. But now there's grievous sin. But I want you to notice verse 22, and I'll be done in just a moment. Verse number 22 said, How be it. It looks dark for Samson. He's blind. It looks dark for Samson. He's bound. But all of a sudden, God the Holy Ghost inspires the writer of the book of Judges to pin the word, how be it. And then I begin to look up that word. That word, how be it, means in spite of. It means nevertheless. It means be that as it may. It means however. It means nevertheless, yet but. I'm telling you, it looks dark for Samson. And the devil's told you, it looks dark for you. 
Oh, but I'm telling you tonight, God oh, could drop a heavenly how be it oh, right in the middle of your life and change your nighttime or oh, to daytime. He could change your listen, your guilt and your shame oh, to peace. I'm telling you, he could take your bitterness away and replace it with joy. He could take your hard heart and melt it like, listen, like hot glue. And listen, I'm telling you, God could give you a how be it or like he did Samson and your life would never be the same. Your life would never be the same. Brother Steve said it well. Somebody's hurt you. These wives in here, your husband's left you. But now you're bitter. And you're bound. And you're blind. Let me tell you, your unhealed hurt will soon turn into bitterness. And it's been a long time since you felt God, like the second verse of that song, put them arms of grace around you. You've read your Bible, you've prayed, you've come to church and been faithful, you've done your duty. But that's about as, that's about as full as it's been. But I'm telling you tonight, there is bomb still in Gilead. There still is a physician there. And you could say, and listen, I'm bitter. I've been injured. My soul is bleeding. Oh, but God could hang a how be it on you tonight. He could hang a how be it and go to where that wound is and go to where the world stuck you and cut you and broke you down and put a how be it in your life so it'll never be the same. You say, preacher, I messed up. I've committed some sin. I like Dr. Roloff's song. He sang all them years ago. Brother Carl sings it. Every once in a while, I just play it on my radio, play it on my telephone when I'm going around. That it goes deeper than the stain has gone. Brother, well, I'm glad them how be it's reach real deep, neighbor. Hey, I'm glad Brother Randy... See, you're talking about them folks getting in. See, that's the shepherd in you. Them evangelists don't much care about them sheep getting in because they ain't done nothing to help them while they get in the first time. They ain't been worried about them while they out there feeding on the blessing on the devil's on the devil's little food plot and drinking out of the devil's pot. Hey, but I'm telling you what, that shepherd, when that sheep tops the hill and you see them, I don't care if they're limping. I don't care what's in the fleece. I don't care how the world scarred them. I'll tell you what that shepherd will do. Oh, that shepherd will take them up. He'll cut that mess out of their fleece. He'll clean them up and bomb them. I'm telling you, blessed be God for the ministry of the shepherd. How be it? Some of you got won't get a how be it because you're too prideful to admit you need one. Some of you won't get a how be it because you're too busy blaming everybody else for your condition instead of yourself. Four things I'm done. I don't have no sub points. I'm not going to preach them. I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give you thing, four things that, that Samson got back after his how be it. Number one, Samson got his separation back. Don't worry, I'm not going to preach on a whole bunch of standards. Everybody take a deep breath. Amen. <laughs> but I remember, I just remind you, though, he did say he put special requirements on us. But that ain't the separation I'm talking about. When he laid his dead head down in the, head, in the lap of that harlot, the devil skinned his head. And that was what had separated him. I don't believe, Brother Willard, I don't believe Samson was a big man. I don't believe he, I don't believe he looked like he was on steroids. I don't believe he looked like football players and giants. He probably looked about, maybe about the size of these two boys right here. Because if he'd been in his muscles, God wouldn't have got no glory. But when a little man goes to carrying gates off a city... And a little man takes a jawbone and kills a thousand. I'm not talking about no K-bar. I'm not talking about a Taurus or a Beretta. I'm not talking about a 30 out 6 I'm talking about a jawbone of a donkey. I'm telling you what, Ram he made Rambo look like Barney, amen? And he killed a thousand men. And I'll tell you what, he got him in there and said, you're dead. You ain't never going to get it again. 
Let me tell you, there's some of y'all sitting on these pews tonight and the devil's ravaged your fruit tree. He's cut every bud off. He's cut every branch off. He's took every bit of fruit hanging off your branches. Oh, but can I tell you one thing? He may rob you of your fruit just like they did Samson. Oh, but can I tell you, good neighbor, he'll never touch your root. He didn't do anything to put your root there and he can't do anything to take it away. You may be fruitless. Your tree may be skint. Oh, but I'm telling you, hang on long enough. Oh, there'll be some new blossoms. Oh, there'll be some new branches. And there'll be some new fruit if you'll hang on. What was it you separate you? What used to make you stand alone? What used to make you stand, stand apart from the crowd? But now it's gone. I got a message I preach on how's your hair and the whole time I preach it I carry around a pack of clippers you know who gets nervous these little effeminate boys that's afraid I'm going to cut their hair them girls know I won't touch their hair but them effeminate boys is afraid I'm going to skin their head huh can I tell you something you can get your separation back can I tell you what else he got back he got his strength back in verse number 28 the Bible said, remember me and strengthen me. I wonder what it felt like, Brother Josh, after all that time, when that little boy put his hands on them pillars. And once again, that strength rolled through his hands, rolled through his fingers. He said, wonderful. He said, that's it, Lord. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know. Maybe it's been a while since you got so full you had a shout on your lips. Brother Willard, I'm glad God sent me to the mountains where they some shouting women. Hallelujah. I, man, I was cocking my teeth, Miss Brenda. No, listen, I know a lot of folk don't like that day, but you looking at one young preacher at us. I cut my teeth on them women shouting. I mean, I was lost when I first heard them, and it convicted me as much as that preaching did. Because I knew I didn't have what they had. I remember Miss Lucille Edmonds used to come out of that choir a clapping them hands and she'd get happy. She'd say, Brother Edgar, I want to say a word. And boy, she'd get happy and she'd dance around there and she'd shout it out. And them old-fashioned ladies, I'm telling you what, I'm glad that's not out of style. I'm glad they still some teenage girls. If you get your hair back and you let God fill you with the Holy Ghost, it wouldn't be long you'd lay that head back and you'd lay out some Holler, and you say, dear God, what I just do? Uh, am I telling it right, preacher? Am I preaching it? Am I rightly dividing? See, we've come in so whooped. The devils took a stick to us and beat the devil out of us all week. And we come in so beat down. Oh, but I'm telling you tonight, God can hang a how be it at you. And you can feel the strength in your legs again. And the strength in your arms again. And the joy in your soul again. And it'd be like it ain't never been before. Got his strength back. Number three, I told you I'm hurry. He got his spirit back. Judges 13, the Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord moved upon Samson. Can I tell you the first place it moved on him? It moved on him where he lived. Look at here, neighbor. If you can't build a fire at home and you can't build a fire at church, don't tell me you can build one at school. Y'all hear me, kids? Learn how to build a fire. See, I won't be like them fire brands. I've been preaching a little bit lately on, won't you just get your tail on fire for God out of them story on them foxes. When I'm preaching to adults, I preach it this way because they get all tight, you know, on them crazy titles. So I just preach it on the telltale signs of being on fire for God. But when I'm preaching to teenagers, I just say, won't you get your tail on fire for God? <laughs> Brother Brent, I won't be like one of them fire brands that he lit to set them fox's tails on fire. Can I tell you something? They've been soaked in the oil. Can I tell you something about them fire brands? They were easily lit but hard to extinguish. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Can I tell you, young preachers ought to be real good firebrands. Amen. 
Listen to me. So a young preacher can't worship and can't shout on somebody else's preaching, can't shout on somebody else's singing. Honey, your firebrand ain't been in the right kind of oil long enough. Honey, when you soak it in the right wood, you soak it in the right place, honey, they could say boo and you'd feel God and want to say amen. Got his spirit back. And you'd say, I just want you to know. I like that line, Brother Carl. My favorite line in that whole song is, for all them times, you just let me see your glory. Well, I've seen it in here some nights, preacher. I've seen it in here some nights. Hey, man, the glory of God. Hey, now, young person, you can get your, how be it tonight? Get your spirit back. I'm done preaching right here. Got a strength back. Got a separation back. Got a spirit back. He got his standing back. Samson was a disgrace to his family. The Bible said he killed more in his death than he did in his life. That'd be enough that his daddy went up there and got him and buried him in the family plot. Put him up there where all the Manoah knights were. Put him up there. That'd be enough. But see, there's another verse that tells me that God restored his standing after that hair began to grow again. Well, if I was to walk over to Hebrews chapter 11 and try to find Isaiah, I couldn't find it. And if I walked over to Isaiah 11 and I tried to find Jeremiah, I'd spend all day, Caleb, and it wouldn't be there. If I walked over to Hebrews chapter 11, tried to find Job, wouldn't find it. Tried to find Nehemiah, Malachi, I wouldn't find it. But took right there at the bottom of Hebrews 11, it said time forbids it. But I'd say a little bit about Barak and Samson and Samson and Samson. The devil lied to you and said you're done because you messed up. The devil's told you that God can't forgive you because God's the devil put a mark on you. But I'm telling you, a man that laid down with harlots on more than one occasion, I walk into the Cooperstown of the King James Bible. I walk into the Canton, Ohio of the King James Bible and where Isaiah's not and where Job's not and where Isaiah and Jeremiah and Nehemiah and Malachi and Habakkuk are not. I find the name of a man that slipped with a harlot but God restored his standing and the Lord can restore yours tonight. There's a lot in that how be it, Brother Owen. Because we went from complete hopelessness to standing in the company of the giants of the Word of God. Look, I preach some of the best men in America. You know how I know? They told me they was. Amen. <laughs> I mean, they told me. They told me how privileged I was to be preaching with them. Amen. Amen. It's the truth. Some of you have been beat, whooped. If I could look at your heart, your life scarred. Your sores are still running. I'm talking about saved people, not lost people. Teenagers that used to have the touch of God. Teenagers that used to live right. Teenagers used to weep with joy in their heart. But you're so busy pointing your finger at everybody else. You can't get it how bit. I wonder where they learned that, mom and dad. They learned that by watching us. Let me tell you something, mom. You better be real careful. You'll pass that bitterness that's in you right on down to your daughter. The best thing you could do tonight is get you a how be it and let God take your darkness and change it into great light. One word, he said, how be it. Hey, Brother Andy, I wonder what it felt like. Because, see, he couldn't see. And let me just tell you this, youngins. There is a premium on living right. Let me just say this. I'm not telling you to go out and live like all Hades and you're going to think everything's going to be all right. Samson got his hair back, but let me just remind you something, kids. He's still blind. And he's still dead. 
I just want you all to understand that don't mean go out there and run and do anything you want to and think you're going to come back and everything's going to be all right. There are some things that forgiveness doesn't do. Like restore lost opportunities. Some of you are going to go to the world one day and while you're out there, somebody's going to die that you wish you'd have got right with. But your opportunity's going to be gone. I thought I'd say that. But tonight, preacher, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. What do you need? You need a how be it. That first morning he said, Whew, glory to God. He said, hey boy, hey little boy that's looking after me, it ain't going to be long. Just hold on. And that one day he felt it in him. He said, let's go down there, boy. Show me them pillars. And Samson said, only this once. I wonder if we had some people of God that would do like Brother Steve said. See, same thing. He's going to pick you up, make you over again. And he's waiting for somebody to say, he's got a how be it for you. I'm preaching tonight on the thought a heavenly how be it? Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. Well, Randy, who you want to do the invitation? Can I, you want me to give the invitation? Miss Shelley, would you come? Who, Brother Randy, who you want to see? Brother Josh is coming. Maybe some folks would say tonight, two messages on God giving a second chance. Hey, look at here. Aren't you glad the Bible said in the book of Jonah, and the word of the Lord came into Jonah the second time? The second time. You know what? I'm glad he's, he would say he's a God of second chances. He's a God of third chances and four chances and fifth chances. How many would be honest tonight and say, Preacher, I've let some things grieve God. And I need a how be it in my life. I need God to change my shame, my guilt, my emptiness, my joyless Christian life back into a place. God bless you, Dad. God bless you, Mom. God bless you, teenager. God bless you, ma'am. Preacher, pray for me. God bless you, son. Preacher, it's been a long time since that joy has run through my bones and my flesh and my spirit. God bless you, son. Preacher, it's been a long time since I felt that overwhelming joy, that rivers of joy flowing up in my life. And preacher, it ain't nobody's fault but mine. I need a how be it. Anybody else before I pray? Anybody else? Preacher, pray for me. I've been blind. I've been bound. And some of you sat this week and watched other people rejoice and you've wanted to rejoice, but you've been bound. But tonight, God could give you a how be it. Anybody else? God bless you, honey. God bless you. Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight. Thank you for letting me be a part of this service. I pray that you take the word of God, speak to these folks' hearts. Many, many, many have lifted their hands tonight. While they sing, I pray that folks would respond and let God put a how be it right down in the middle of their life. Don't let them believe the lie. The devil can't take them to hell, but he can ruin their life if they listen. Take that empty space that's been hurt, cut and injured. Pack it with the bomb of the Holy Ghost. 